taking a little bit to turn on. Hmm. All right, we're just waiting. Okay, the recording has just come on. All right, so uh, good morning, everyone. So this semester, uh, I'll be doing two courses with you. Um, one is on urban church planting, and then we are doing another course um, later this week on church and ministry administration. So both these courses are, you know, very practical courses. Um, the urban church planting course will focus on how to plant a church in an urban context, that means in a city. But um, uh, two things, we don't have to restrict what we're learning just to the city. You can also apply it to a town or a village or any other region. And secondly, uh, although we will be talking mainly about church planting, if you are intending to start some other kind of ministry, you know, may not be a local church, but maybe some other kind of ministry in the city, in an urban context or elsewhere, you can take all of these things that we're learning and you can also apply it to uh, whatever you're going to do, right? So. While the focus is urban church planting, and uh, that's, uh, we will explain why um, uh, that, that's an important focus, but you can take these things and you can apply it in other contexts as well. And uh, the other course, Church and Ministry Administration, I'll introduce uh, you know, later in the week as we start that course. Now, I've uh, put out the PDF as usual uh, in the uh, Google Classroom. Uh, and you can take the PDF, you may have already done that. Uh, just follow along with me as we go through it. And for those of you uh, in the class, uh, you know, you will get your uh, printed version uh, shortly. Then I'm on, we'll get that here. Okay, so uh, here are the course notes, um, just uh, going through it. You know, why is this particular course very important? Because if you, if we think about what is happening all over the world, what is happening is people are moving into the city. They're moving into urban areas. You know? uh, slowly, people are moving away from the rural context, and they're moving more and more towards cities, maybe towns. Uh, and these populations are growing. So if you look at just, just general statistics, by 2050, you know, so we're talking about within the next 30 years or so, uh, the 54 over 50 percent of the world's population will be in urban areas. Uh, there's this whole movement towards that, and uh, in different countries, that percentage will be higher. You know, so that movement is going to be higher, the transition will be higher. In some countries, you know, a huge percentage of that national population is in urban centers already, but this is just looking at things globally. So our goal is we need more people. You know, we need more people who know how to work in urban context. How do you plant churches? How do you start ministries? How do you reach people in urban centers, right? Uh, and how do we do that? Both from a spiritual perspective and a very practical, natural perspective. How do we do these things? So that's what we are going to explore. And basically, uh, you know, uh, we're going to keep this very practical in the sense that uh, we're going to share with you things that we have done ourselves here in Bangalore, uh, that we are learning, we are doing, you know, uh, and also, we're going to draw from you know other city, uh, other sorry, other city churches or other city ministries globally. So uh, there will be a lot of things that I share, saying, look, this is, how we, this is what we are doing. Uh, but we will also be drawing lessons from uh, other churches and ministries who are doing uh, work in urban context. Now, of course, you know where you are things may be slightly different, things may be, you know, uh, you, you will need to contextualize this and say, okay, 
this is where I am. This is the city where I'm living in. So I can, and this is how I will put it to work where I am. So those things can be a little different, uh, but uh, generally we are going to share things that we've done, which hopefully will be you know, uh, relevant to all of us, regardless of what urban center, where we are. Uh, just an overview of the course, um, we are going to, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about my personal journey, uh, and we kind of give an overview of how we should approach uh, church planting or starting a ministry in a, in a city. Uh, just some overview of uh, and how, how do you plan, how do you go about it. Then we get into, in section two, we get into some practical aspects. That is, uh, you know, what are the things you can do? And these are some things we encourage our Bible college students to do, especially as they're preparing, you know, they're, they're, as they're preparing to graduate, get ready to go, uh, and you're thinking about, you know, you feel God has called you to start a church, then, you know, uh, these practical things that we talk about are, are very useful for you to keep in mind uh, as you prepare to go start a church or any kind of ministry in an urban context. We also need to talk about the spiritual side of things. Uh, so it's not just the, you know, the natural side, this is how you do it, but also the spiritual side. How do you pray? How do we equip people? Uh, how do you, you know, spiritually uh, mobilize the church to impact uh, where you are, the city where you are? And then we want to talk about your personal life. And this is very important because uh, uh, you know, uh, everything hinges on you as a person. Uh, if, uh, you know, we can be very excited and start the work, but if you don't have what it takes to stay the course, uh, then, you know, things can just fall apart. So it's very important. And we want to talk about, you know, some of the challenges that uh, we must be prepared for when you are pioneering, when you're starting a work in the urban context. So uh, what are some things we can do to make sure we succeed uh, in this journey uh, of uh, pioneering or church planting in an urban context? Then we just, you know, we will keep this kind of a more of an open sec section where we look ahead and see, you know, how are things going to change? How are things going, what are things going to look like uh, in, you know, 10, 20 years from now so that we can, you know, constantly be prepared because the city is changing all around us. Things, you know, if you, uh, you know, you can, you know, recognize that, you know, in 10 years, the city around you uh, changes dramatically, drastically. And so, so uh, it's important to, you know, kind of always be ready and prepared for the way things would go in the city. Um, yeah, and as usual, you know, we'll break our assessments into these three things. Now, uh, two or three, yeah, before the pandemic, I don't know, it was 2019, uh, the way we graded this course was uh, I had actually had the students actually do a project um, uh, uh, and, you know, and, and, and write up a plan on actual planting a church and then do a presentation on that. So uh, I'm just wondering whether you know, something like that can be done uh, in an online context where uh, instead of kind of giving, you know, question answers, um, uh, we, uh, we, we just do it as a project and then you present that back uh, to, um, to us for review. Uh, that means you, you take this and you apply it to a city. You imagine you are going in a hypothetical, it could be an actual or it could be a hypothetical uh, context where you say, look, I am going to plant a church in such and such a city or I am going to start a youth ministry or a children's ministry or a, or a, you know, a marriage ministry or whatever, whatever kind of ministry um, in, in this city. And therefore, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do it like this. Uh, we could even think of doing it like a, project. Uh, what do you feel? Um, I just want to know, do you like to do a project-based uh, assessment or do you like to do question answers? I know question answers are much simpler. <laughs> you just check the boxes. Uh, but uh, project-based means um, you'll have to invest time. And we usually did it in small groups. You know, So we break the class into groups of four and they would work as a group. 
in developing the project and plan on how they would plant the church. And, and what do you what do you feel? What do you guys think? Uh, do you want to do it as an individual project? You can say your thoughts in the chat. Uh, and uh, getting in, in as a group, we are all in different parts of the world, so that might be a little difficult. But if you if, if if people are okay with doing it as a project, as an individual project, uh, that is fine. Or if you just want to leave it as question answers, we we'll leave it as question answers. What do you want, want, want to think about it? Let me know uh, on Thursday. Okay, um, y'all just think about it. How you would like to, you know, do your assessment right now? I'm just thinking of just in doing question answers as usual. Uh, that's easy for everybody. Uh, project will require a lot more thought and research, and uh, you actually think about your city and do research on it and so on. Uh, and I'm fine either way. Uh, doing the project will, of course, require more time and effort, but will also be more beneficial. Um, um, yeah, I see Charles' uh, response Q&A, Mangi, thinking about a group uh, project. Mm. I'm just wondering if we could uh, uh, do a brief project. Okay, have a thought about it, think about it, and uh, uh, we'll uh, finalize on Thursday how uh, we should do the assessment, okay? So let's get back to, uh, I'll just continue sharing and uh, you know, we'll, we'll decide this uh, on Thursday. All right, so here we are. We, uh, I, I've given you these course notes, which, will, which we will be following. Uh, there's also a nice book. You know, there are many, many books actually uh, available on church planting, urban church context and so on. But one of the landmark books uh, was written back in 1989, I know it's quite a many years ago, called uh, Taking Our Cities for God by John Gosselin. Uh, there are many other books uh, having to do with urban church planting, urban ministry, etc. But this is a very, like a, a starter book. Uh, it, it had a huge impact when it was released back in 1989. Uh, people began to read it and say, hey, you know, we can have a very uh, strategic approach uh, towards planting churches in cities. You know, it kind of really triggered a lot of thought on that and brought, brought in a spiritual perspective uh, towards church planting and so on. So I've shared that PDF also with you. Uh, you're welcome to read it or go through it uh, if you like. And then there are other free APC books that you could use, uh, which will help you and some of the things that we talk about. So uh, just a little bit about my own personal journey, um, uh, why I personally feel very strongly about church planting. You know, so, and, and this goes back way in time. When I was in school, uh, through uh, grade nine to 12, I was studying here in Bangalore, uh, in my uh, so there was a prayer group already running in my school uh, here in Bangalore, uh, and we used to meet during the lunch break. You know we had a very short lunch break, but as students we used to get together uh, during lunch break right after lunch for about 15, 20 minutes prayer. But then that was so powerful because many people, many students, including myself, gave our lives to Christ because of that prayer group. And we came to faith in Christ you know, through that. But then what I noticed was um, that uh, I could reach out to some friends and uh, invite them during, we had a short break between 11 to 11.15. So I said, hey, you know, I can catch some two friends uh, if they don't want to come for the, you know, the longer lunch breaks. Uh, uh, I can catch them during the tea break that we had between 11 to 11.15 and get them to faith and uh, teach them the Bible. So I kind of started another group in my own school during that time that would meet during the tea break, 7 to 11, 15, some of my friends and others, and, you know, suddenly they, they came to Christ. And then during the lunch break, uh, I, I decided to, you know, what was happening in my school, 
I decided to do that in two other schools. Um, so there were two other schools nearing where I was uh, in Bangalore. And during lunch break, uh, four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, I would go to another school, which is called Ball and Boys School. So I used to run there, and you know, I should run from my school to that school, do a 20 minute prayer meeting, run back to my school. And on Wednesdays, I would run to another school, it is called Cathedral School. It was also not too far from our school. And so I would run there and I would you know, do a prayer meeting, 15, 20 minutes and get back. So basically I was running three prayer groups, one in my own school and two groups in another, two other schools. A lot of uh, students just my age were coming to faith in Christ during that time. And then on Saturdays, I started a prayer group in uh, the church that I was going to. I was part of a Methodist church in that same area in Richmond Town. And every Saturday, I had a prayer group. And you know, there were people who would come, all ages, they would come, they'd be part of the group, and I would teach them the Word of God and so on. So that happened during those years. Um, uh, about four years or so, uh, and it was a wonderful experience. But uh, as soon as I left, I left my city, I left Bangalore to go to do my bachelor's in Manipal, all of these groups just died because I didn't know and I didn't even think that, hey, when I leave, uh, somebody has to continue this work. So as soon as I left Bangalore to go and to my bachelor's, uh, all these groups just came to an end, standstill. And I felt very bad because, you know, for three to four years, almost four years, I had uh, invested so much of time and effort into starting these groups. It had a lot of fruit. Uh, people came to faith, people were growing, but it all disappeared as soon as I left. And that's when it really hit me, you know, that whenever you do a work, you must always think about raising more leaders. You must think about raising people who will continue the work after you leave. So it was a very, you know, it, 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 it was a, like a shocking lesson to me uh, when that happened. Nobody really told me, uh, and nobody, you know, advised me. I didn't have anyone, you know, guiding me. Uh, uh, so, all these four groups just came to a standstill uh, when I left. Then when I went to engineering college uh, in Manipal, that, that is where I did my bachelor's uh, in engineering, uh, there were a few, you know, there were certain churches already there in, that Mani, in Manipal, um, but there was no English spirit-filled work happening, at least not to my knowledge, in Manipal as a town. It was basically a student town. Uh, there was a prayer fellowship, but uh, people there didn't know about the work of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, about praying in tongues and so on. So during the first two years, it is, uh, 19, I, moved, I went there in 1986. So the first two years, I kind of you know, worked with an existing, you know, existing believers, getting them you know, introduced to the Holy Spirit and so on. Then in 1989, uh, January of 1989, I started a, a, a fellowship. And the reason I started that fellowship was they, so that we could have freedom uh, to preach and teach the word of God, uh, as opposed to being restricted in you know, the existing fellowships that were there. Uh, I didn't want to disturb them because they were you know, within existing church structures. And so I went out started something where we would have complete freedom to preach and teach the things of the spirit, uh, faith and healing and uh, so on. And so we started this work in 1989. That is during my third year in college. But this time I was very careful. I said, uh, I am going to raise up somebody before I leave to make sure that this work continues. Because I had, you know, always remembered what happened uh, to these four groups in Bangalore, that they all, three or four groups yeah, in Bangalore, that they all just dissolve after I left. So I remember that. And also in Manipal, I began to use some of these spiritual principles about prayer and intercession. You know, one book that uh, greatly influenced me uh, was uh, 
uh, uh, prayer, Key to Revival by Yonggi Cho. Uh, and in that book, he shared how he prayed uh, for, you know, the, the Seoul, in Seoul, Korea, now, the prayer mountain, how they pray to see a great revival. So uh, I began to use those spiritual principles over money power. And also some practical things. You know, we, we, we held some seminars and one or, or meetings. So one of the first meetings that we did there in the hotel was uh, the final countdown. You know, there was a, uh, there was some band that had released some pop music or something called the final countdown. So everybody was listening to that secular music. So I picked up that title and I held a, you know, a, 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 an evening event called the final countdown. People came and we preached to them about the end times, you know, and the coming of Christ. I said, look, it's the final countdown. You know, and that, that had an impact on a lot of students. And that, that's kind of how this, this whole fellowship grew. And, uh, and, and so there, there was a lot of learning in how to pioneer that work, how to get it started, how to reach out to student community, how to care for people, uh, and how to pray and engage in the spiritual for that work. And one of the big learnings over there was that I, I intentionally found out, I, I was praying, of course, and then uh, the Lord put in my heart a young man whose name was Davis. He was a medical student. I was in the engineering college. Uh, he wasn't a medical student. He was a medical student. And so, you know, it's like, okay, Davis is going to be the next person to take over from you. So as soon as I recognized that, you know, over two semesters, I really spent a lot of time with Davis. And so Davis, you know, uh, uh, when I leave, I'm giving you the responsibility to continue. I'm going to give you the responsibility to continue this work. And so, and I shared with him the vision. I said, see, now we have just 20, 30, 30 students coming together, uh, but we want this to grow into, a, you know, hundreds, hundreds of students. And we want to see even families come in. We want to see, see this become a, you know, a strong, self-sustaining church, you know, work here in Manipa. So I led that work for three semesters. And then before I left, I handed the work over to Davis, and then Davis really took it forward. Uh, the amazing thing happened, you know, um, the, the year after I left, the work just continued growing. Uh, they had some people come in from outside to preach and minister, and, uh, you know, there was just an explosive growth. And that work became a solid work, where there were more than 200 students, spirit-filled, worshiping God in spirit and truth every you know, so what started with just a handful of people became a strong body there for many years. And of course, these were all students, engineering college, medical college, dental, law, others would come to be a part of this work. And then when they graduate, they'll go into different parts of the world. So Manipal, they, they, they formed it as a legal body called Manipal Believers Fellowship, and they brought in a pastor, and the work, you know, really continued growing. Uh, Later on, some unfortunate things happened. There was conflict, it split, and the one part of it continues still today, or I, I, you know, uh, in, in, in its own its own form. It's been renamed and it continues on. So, but anyway, uh, that was a wonderful journey as far as learning and transitioning and seeing the work grow. Even though I was not personally there, I left to the U.S. in 1990. Uh, this was a great experience. Then when I went to the U.S., um, there again, I, uh, in the, the university, I initially started attending. Um, I, I, there was no uh, student, but there was no Bible study for international students. And uh, there was a, a fellowship that was going on, but it was mainly uh, you know, Americans. Now, I didn't see anything happening for international students. So uh, I got permission to start the work for international students on campus. And that was wonderful, and uh, that happened uh, there. And uh, then I moved to New Jersey, uh, where I had a wonderful time serving uh, with uh, a Korean Christian Student Fellowship. Uh, you know, there were about 300 Korean students who would gather every Thursday, and uh, I was part of that, the only Indian sitting in that big auditorium with Korean Christians. But it was just wonderful time. Fellowship got to mentor some of those Korean students, and nurture them. And I was also ministering at an African American local church. So they were, uh, the pastor there really gave me an open door. So I would preach often on Sunday mornings, 
and on Wednesday nights I would teach a Bible study uh, at this African American church. Um, it's a small church, uh, but it was just wonderful friendship and fellowship. I did that for some time, and then uh, uh, you know again God orchestrated a connection with uh, uh, the Hispanic people. So they were staying very close to where uh, we were living, uh, and um, so these are many people from South America, uh, mainly from Central and South America, uh, speaking Spanish and so on. So uh, I kind of relieved myself from uh, serving the Korean and the African American church. And I'd been there for about two, two to three years serving there, and I released myself. I said, okay, no, let me just concentrate on one thing. So, and by the time I got married as well, so Amy and I, we started concentrating and serving. We helped pioneer a bilingual church, so the English and Spanish church, uh, mainly serving the Hispanic people, that is people, Spanish speaking people from Central and South America. And again, it was a wonderful thing. We started from scratch and we saw the work you know, grow. And, uh, and there was another couple, Spanish speaking couple who were co-pastoring with us. Uh, so the services would be in English and Spanish. Worship would be in English and Spanish. Um, and then uh, we traveled with them uh, on two trips to Ecuador, ministering to their own people uh, in Ecuador, coming back. So this is a wonderful time. And then we handed the full responsibility of that church to the couple, and then we moved to Chicago. Uh, and, and that work grew. The churches grew. They got their own play, uh, rented, out, rented place, and the, the numbers just increased. We moved to Chicago, and in Chicago, we served um, at a small church there uh, with a local pastor who was pioneering that work. So we just were there to support him and assist him and so on. So during all of these years, um, you know, one of the things that always kept in my mind was that I would plant a church in Bangalore City. And so all of these years, uh, you know, through college and through working in the U.S., I was saying, God, I need to go back and I need to start a church in Bangalore at the right time. But all this experience, uh, both in college, in, my, in school, and then in college in Manipal, and then working with these different communities in the U.S., I felt was a preparation for the main work, which was to plant a church in Bangalore and from there um, go out and impact the nation. So all of looking back, all of that was part of my preparation. So let me pause here before all of you fall asleep uh, uh, to, uh, <laughs> to see if there are any uh, questions so far any, uh, before I go into that next phase. Uh, any questions? Uh, any questions so far? Uh, is, is my sound okay? Uh, are you, can you all hear me? Yes, your sound is okay. We are alert. We are okay. listening in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I hope I wasn't boring you with my own uh, story. So, okay. Louis, is the sound okay? Uh, I, I see a note, it's not clear. Yes, sir. Uh, that's enough, sir. Okay. Yes, that's enough. okay. All right. Okay. So, since yes, all of you are awake, uh, I'll uh, get on to the last part of the story. So, you know, during this time, uh, while we were serving in the U.S., uh, I also used to come back to India, travel through India, uh, doing uh, gospel crusades and pastor seminars um, through that 10-year period while uh, I was in the U.S. So I tra traveled mainly to South India, and then I started slowly traveling through parts of North India uh, during uh, these 10 years, 1990 to 2000, doing, like I said, crusades and conferences. And I was always praying, saying, God, I need to come back to India. And I knew I had to come back to Bangalore, that was my home city, and start a church that will impact the nation. So in 1998, when I was traveling and ministering through India, I felt very strongly in my heart. Time has come, you need to prepare to go back to India. So this was end of 1998. So when I went back, uh, I told my wife, okay, let's start preparing. We're going to plan on going back to India. We'll give ourselves about one year. So all will take, you know, uh, sorry, one and a half years, a little more than one year. 
but 2000 December, we are going to move back. We kind of made a plan, right? We're going to go back to India. So we started preparing. So some of the things I've been talking about in terms of preparation are things we did in those years, you know, but of course, how much of preparation we could do was limited because we didn't have all the information that today is so readily available online. And we didn't have it in those days. But uh, so to 1999 uh, and the year 2000, the early part of the year 2000, was all about preparing to go back to India. And then in December of 2000, we made the move. Yeah, we packed everything, we left everything, I mean, just dispensed of everything, full move back to Bangalore. Yeah. And so 2001 to 2014, um, uh, I pioneered the church while at the same time I was working, uh, running my own uh, business. So I was, you know, people would call it bivocational. That means I was pastor, pioneering and pastoring the church as well as running the business. And then in 2014, June, uh, I transitioned and uh, focused, I started focusing fully on the church. And then over these years, uh, you know, we've, we've, uh, we started establish multiple locations in Bangalore. And we started planting churches in other countries, in India. And we also looked at planting churches in other countries. Now, whatever we did in other countries didn't survive so far. Uh, things uh, had to close or transition off, but we, you know, we're still looking uh, looking at uh, planting churches in other countries, and uh, and uh, you know what opened up just during the pandemic was in the Bible College having students from uh, all over the world, and also opportunities to set up uh, uh, an entity in the U.S. that can support the work in other countries. So all of that is now coming together and. Uh, uh, next year, 2023, we will be actually able to, you know, plant and support churches in other countries as well. But uh, it'll continue to happen both within India and overseas. And we'll share some of those things, right? Now, what I want to confess is uh, when we started in 2001, when we came to Bangalore to plant a church and start, uh, we didn't have all the learning that we have today. Today is almost 20 years later. Uh, we can look back and say, oh, I wish I knew, knew it then. You know, we didn't, uh, a lot of things have, you know, learned, we learned as we did things, as we experimented, some things worked, some things didn't work. Um, but it was all a learning process. And hopefully through this course, uh, we will be able to, you know, share our learnings, things that worked in a city like Bangalore, uh, which is among the largest cities in India, and, uh, you know, what did in work. And then, then we wanted to plant more churches around the country. You know, some churches survived, some didn't. Uh, and, you know, we, even that was a learning process. And uh, we learned through all of this. And so uh, hopefully through this course, we will share uh, what we have learned. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Everyone is with me so far? Any questions? All good? Okay, so the first thing that uh, we want to emphasize uh, and which we, you know, we must never forget is that as we talk about planting a church or starting a ministry, the first thing is we have to depend on the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is our leader. You know, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus told us, you know, you will receive power. When he gave the great commission to his disciples and said, you know, you go and make disciples. He said, you go and make disciples of all the nations. One thing he assured them and promised them was, you will receive power and the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witness. So that's so important. And, you know, some of you are going to start churches. Some of you may be, you know, actually starting a church, doing the pioneering of work. Whatever you do, you have to depend on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our leader. Now, let me just share this with you. You know, 
uh, I said that, you know, in, in 1999 and to early part of 2000, we were making plans to how we are going to start the church in India when we moved back. And so, you know, whatever I knew, whatever understanding I had, I put it down. Of course, I prayed and I put it down. And, uh, you know, uh, but when we actually moved back to Bangalore, uh, we really didn't know that many people. And uh, uh, once we moved back, end of December 2000, uh, I was looking for a place to start. But, you know, trying to look for a hall, this and that. And in you know, Bangalore still at the city because we've been out of touch. Seemed very new to us. We didn't know too much or too many people, and it was so difficult to find a place, a hall that we could start. So I remember in the early part of January, I was praying, saying, "God, you know, I've been looking for a hall, not finding, no place. Where do we start?" So on. But I remember one morning, one day, as I was praying, the Lord just answered in a very simple way. He said, "Start with what you have. Start." with what you have. Now that simple word, you know, some of us may think, well, that's common sense, you know. But here I was, in my mind, I was thinking about a big hall, auditorium, I have to rent, find a place, this, that. So my, my thinking was going in some other direction. So God had to speak. And all he said was simple. Start with what you have. And I asked myself, what do I have? And at that time, we had just returned and we were staying temporarily with my father in his house. And uh, that, was, that was what I had. So I went to my dad. I said, Dad, uh, is it okay if we start the church in the living room of our house? Is it okay? He said, absolutely. Let's start. This happened in January. Within two weeks, we said, okay, two weeks is enough. We get ourselves ready. Uh, buy some minimal equipment that we need for starting in the living room, a keyboard. Uh, you don't even need a mic. Uh, just get everything there and start. So when that word came, this actual word, and February 18, 2000, 2001, 2001, we started. But what I want to point or bring our attention to is that word from the Holy Spirit. See how important that word was. It's a very simple word. Start with what you have. Because in my mind, I was going in other directions, right? I was thinking about, I have to find a hall. I have to do all this, you know, get all this organized. And I was thinking, you know, in a, in a, in a different way. Whereas God was just saying, look, start like this. So the Holy Spirit is our leader. And he will lead each one of us. Accordingly, so uh, I will share with you how we started other churches in Bangalore uh, and on so on. I remember after we had started our first location, which was uh, what today what we call as APC Central, and this was in the year uh, 2001, and we had just started 2001 or 2002. I just must I forget exactly. I can I have to go and look it up, but. Uh, sorry, 2002, yeah. So 2001, we started the main, what we call a central. And 2002, the very next year, uh, we were, I was in my office, that is the business office, software business office one day. I was sitting in my office doing my work. Suddenly I felt a prompting in my spirit. Okay, so I'm doing my regular work. I am doing my business work, software work. But I felt a prompting in my spirit. It is time to start a church in Jainagar. Jainagar is the southern part of our city, Bangalore South. I just felt in my spirit. And this is what happened. I got up from my seat. I walked across the office to the other end of the office where our admin person was sitting. And I told him, uh, his name was Prem. So I said, Prem? Just open the telephone book, find a agent in a real estate agent in Bangalore South, and tell him we want a place for a church. And you won't believe this is what happened. He opened the phone book. In those days, we had phone books. <laughs> he opened the phone book, 
yellow pages, he found a first agent. He called that number and said, we're looking for an office space. We want to rent it out for the church to start a church service. The first phone call he made, the person said, yes, I have a space. Come and see it. That's it. He went, he saw the place, and that became the place. Within two weeks, we started uh, what we call as APC South or Bangalore South. But just think about it. I'm not saying every time it happens like this, but this is how it happened in these two instances. I, I will share other instances that were different. But just think about it. It was just another day in the office. But the Holy Spirit prompted saying, this, do it now. Time to start a church in Bangalore South. And I walked across. I told the admin, just open call. He did it. And one call got us a place where we started where we launched uh, our church in Bangalore South. So like this, you know, there are so many uh, wonderful stories, and I'm sure many of you have experienced how the Holy Spirit leads us in this whole process of, uh, uh, you know, planting a church, starting a ministry, or doing something for the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit, and when the Holy Spirit is leading us, we can go with great confidence. And uh, we'll stop with this verse, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. We know this, you know, as, uh, as you know, as, uh, God is speaking uh, through his prophet, Zechariah, uh, to, uh, to Zerubbabel, who was leading the work. And, of course, there, was, uh, there were other people helping him um, and uh, the, uh, leading the work of rebuilding the temple. And God tells them, you know, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. And this was a physical work. They had to rebuild the temple. Now, the temple had been destroyed, and they had to get people together and they had to rebuild it. And God is saying, that work is not by might, it's not by human strength, not by human power, but it's going to be done by the Holy Spirit. Of course, it's going to be done through people. But it's a work of the Spirit through people in getting that work done. And so uh, we'll talk more about this in our next class on Thursday. But I want to emphasize that in this whole process of starting a ministry, whether it's a church or something else that God would lead you to do, it is so important for us to depend on the leading of the Holy Spirit. And he'll lead us in different ways. I'm not saying every time it'll be the same way. Uh, different times, different things he would lead us with. Uh, but we are depending on the Holy Spirit to lead us, to empower us, to guide us, and to build the work. And when he's in it, no devil, no man can stop it. Right? So we will continue this. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for any questions. Any thoughts, any questions? Everyone's okay? Sir, can I ask a question, sir? Go ahead, Lee, please. Uh, uh, it's, I'm trying to find a balance between um, the plans you, you, you put in place before you move back to India and the simple instruction um, that the Spirit of God gave you on how to start. Uh, I know it doesn't negate the plan, but I just see that uh, sometimes our plans get in the way of um, of um, fulfilling some assignments that God gives us. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think it's um, it's a learning for all of us, and it's a learning for all of us in everything. And I'm, I can tell you, even now, I'm learning where planning is an expression of our stewardship. It's an expression of our being responsible. You know, so God, there is a vision. I feel called to do something. God is leading me to do something. Therefore, I'm going to plan for it. I'm going to make sure that uh, things are all in order. So, for example, you know, going back to my own case, when we started planning, you know, we said, okay, you know, uh, we, we, we didn't buy a house in the U.S. That's on 
purpose because we needed to relocate to India. Or we had a car, but we said, okay, they're going to sell the car. We had, all, you know, we just tried to slowly, get, you know, get rid of things so that we could be in a state where we can readily move. So all that took planning. Yeah? So the planning helped us uh, make a smooth transition. Lee, uh, you know, I was working in the U.S., so I told my company six months before. I said, see, and I, December 2020, I am leaving the company. I'm going to be moving to India. I, I won't be able to work with you. And so I was leading a project there. I said, so you need to put somebody here. You need to find somebody. And for the company, I started interviewing people, you know, who could. So in every way, you know, uh, all that, we were planning. So we we're making our plans. And so that was useful because it put us ready to make the move. But we also were planning on how we are going to do the church plan. And that is where God, you know, maybe I didn't listen properly to God while in, in the U.S. as I was planning those things. Maybe, you know, uh, and so when we came to India and got on the ground here, things were very different. And... Uh, it didn't go as expected. And so I went back to praying, saying, God, okay, things are different here. What do we do? And, you know, God spoke. So I feel to whatever extent we can, we should plan. We should do our part. But at every step of the way, we should keep listening to God and uh, be ready, be flexible, uh, open to how he leads. So that balance, I think the key is stay open all the time. So do your plan. That's being responsible, being a good steward, and it is, it is beneficial. But then always be open to anything the Holy Spirit says so we can just follow him. And sometimes when you're planning, there will be inspiration so that even in the planning, the Holy Spirit can guide us. So that's how I would look at it. I hope I addressed your question, Lou. Yeah, yeah. The, the last thing you said is, is very, uh, very key for me. That inspirational part, where he has to be part of the plans, so that um, you don't plan outside of him. Neither you plan, you know, with certain level of irresponsibility. But there's that balance in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice. Thank you so much. Sir. You're welcome. Anybody else? Any other questions? Okay, no more questions. Let's uh, pray. We we'll close and we we'll, uh, connect again on Thursday and take this forward. Could somebody close in prayer, please? Anyway, Father, we thank you for the class today. We thank you for our pastor, Pastor Ashish. We thank you for every one of us that you have kept this far for the past three years. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you, and most importantly, I pray for listening ears and seeing eyes in this moment that you are giving us directions for the next phase of our lives. We thank you for the words that we hear in this class will be instructional, will be revelational, and will give us the levels of um, direction we need, O oh Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus. We commit the rest of the day to your hands, O oh God, will bless everyone for the blessings of the Lord in Jesus' name. Pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was a great um, connecting back and look forward to uh, joining with you the rest of this semester.